Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and poisoning cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 10! 10! How have we made it to 10? Double digits! (laughs) I can retire now. You you really can't. (laughs) Oh, it's a special day, special episode, special time in our lives. How are you, Nick? Uh, yeah, still in lockdown. Still in lockdown. Still sitting at home, pretending to do some work. No, no, you, you are actually it's... working, because I'm sure your boss listens to I'm this. I'm actually working. I'm very... <laughs> yes, they don't listen to this. Doing lots of poisonous research when I should be working. And then doing lots of working when you're supposed to be poisoning researching, yeah. Poisoning researchers. No, I don't think... No, they're... poisoning researching, I said. I, I heard poisoning it! Poisoning researchers. <laughs> I heard it. I got it wrong. Thank you for pointing that out, Nick. Fine. Pleasure, Lovely. as always. Any poisonings this week? Nip, nip, nip. We're still clear. We're still, We're still clear. clear. You've, you've escaped the wrath of everyone. <laughs> yes. No one can get to me. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, we have a promo to share with you. We would like to share more promos for other podcasts that we love on the show in the coming weeks, just so you've got more inspiration of fantastic shows to enjoy. And this first promo is from the delicious duo over at What the Fuck is in This Book? How does a ghost chicken lay an egg? Are flying priests a thing? What do you do if your two sons become possessed and you can't get them to bed? Is there a hotline for Sasquatch abduction? What if your new pet parrot is a secret arsonist? What kind of rain gear protects you from vulture vomit? Believe it or not, these are actual stories from an actual book. Hey, I'm Will. And I'm Annie. Join us each week as we delve into a story from a book that terrified us as kids as we ask, What what the the fuck fuck is is in this this book? Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Castbox FM. Just search "What the fuck is in this book?" Or follow us on Instagram at WTF is in this book. Brilliant! I adore this podcast. I love those two, Will and Annie. They are hilarious. It's just a brilliant combination of spooky stories, but proper banter. Their humour is right up my street. If you haven't found them yet, go and listen to their podcast. You will not be disappointed. It is pure gold. Love you two. Give them a listen, guys. So it's episode 10. We've got a very special episode coming up to celebrate the fact that we've reached a milestone, as it were. Nick? Hello. Are you ready to drink cocktails and talk about poison? No. I'm sick of it. <laughs> I just... Give me the poison. All right, so, so you'd rather drink poison and talk about cocktails? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I just need the cocktails. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's make episode 10 the final one. This is how we die, everyone. So we always start our episodes, as you loyal listeners will know, with a cocktail that is inspired by the tale that we tell and also helps us tell the story because we get a bit drunk. <laughs> the cocktail has always got a secret ingredient. But this week, we not only have a secret ingredient, we have a secret guest. We do. <gasps> Who could our secret guest be? Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> so this week, as it's episode 10, and we are going to be discussing a very famous case, we thought it warranted a little extra bonus episode. So we have asked our dear, dear friend, Rowanna Bond, to listen in on this episode, and she's going to join us for a bonus episode, sort of dissecting what we've talked about. Rowanna is a psychotherapist who specialises in personality disorders. That's not how we met, but... <laughs> It is. It has been the foundation of our friendship. I Absolutely. think the whole time. <laughs> and Ro is actually with us on the episode. Hello, Ro. Hello. Lovely to be here. Thank you for having Hello. me. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you excited to be in the poisonous cabinet? I'm very excited to be in the poisonous cabinet. I'm particularly excited to drink a cocktail. I'm very excited <laughs> to be here with you. I know the fact the cocktail is the only reason you're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nothing to do with work or uh, you know having a specialist background. It's just the cocktail. Just the cocktail. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Fantastic. It's very much Nick's case this week. We are going to be talking about... We are going to talk about Mary Ann Cotton, <gasps> who I'm sure many people will recognise the name. People say the first female serial killer. English. <laughs> Eng- English female serial killer. I was going to say that several of our episodes will refute that. Yes. Fact, no. <laughs> That's a little caveat in there. First English one. We can't say that every time we have a girl serial killer. Like, yes, the first the... serial killer ever this week. <laughs> Rowanna, do you know much about Mary Ann Cotton, the background? I do, yes. I've actually studied quite a lot about her um, and I got really fascinated by the case a few years back. I mean, she's a fascinating woman. There's a, a huge amount to try and understand about her, really, in terms of why she did what she did and how she got away with it for quite so long. Before we get into the story of Mary Ann Cotton, Rowanna, we got we got to break it to you. It's cocktail time. Yeah. 
time. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, I know. Oh, the no. bloody cocktails must be gotten out of the way before we get to Marianne Cotton. Our secret ingredient this week, Nick, what was the secret ingredient that we chose for episode 10? I told you, it's just had enough. The secret ingredient is arsenic. It's arsenic! <laughs> so, just going with it. Woo! Um, <laughs> arsenic alarm! Arsenic alarm! Make, make episode 10 special <laughs> with an arsenic-based cocktail. Oh, I'm happy and, and scared. <laughs> we really will all be dead at the end of this. Absolutely. It's a good way to go. Well, is it a good way to go out? Probably not, actually. Well, it's um, not for the listeners. I mean, they're just going to be hearing the podcast suddenly dramatically ending of us vomiting and, and, and screaming and going, wow. You, that may well happen with the cocktail that I've made for you as well. <laughs> and even though we are in lockdown, I have made this cocktail and delivered it to Sinead and Ro. Cocktail fairy has been. Sorry, <laughs> I should never call you that again, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I've been called worse, dear. <laughs> I think it's a great title. <laughs> Cocktail delivery service has provided. Nick, being the master mixologist that he is, as we've said, we're all in lockdown. Nick has a beautiful cupboard full of delicious treats and wonderful liqueurs, and Ro and me just have bad wine and perno, probably. <laughs> just kicking around. So Nick has been very kind and delivered a cocktail to us. So Nick, tell us what this week's cocktail is. So this week's cocktail is an arsenic and old lace. No! no. It's, called, uh, it's a fantastic name for a cocktail. Absolutely love the name for a cocktail. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you saying that their name is arsenic and there isn't arsenic in this cocktail? Well, it's called an arsenic in old lace. You'll find out if there's arsenic in it. You say that. We're, trust- we're trusting Nick, yeah, that he hasn't put arsenic in it. We might, he, might, he might want to take over the podcast. We'll just do a solo show. <laughs> oh, so and he's yeah, mixed like, up all the bottles. <laughs> I like your thought there. <laughs> when, I, when I saw you at a distance earlier on and you were handing over the bottles and you suddenly went, No, not that one. That's mine. And then ran away. <laughs> So I feel reassured. As, as you should. <laughs> Nick has delivered the cocktails. They are chilling, but we have to go and mix them up and serve them according to Nick's instructions. <laughs> so I think it's time for us to shake up a storm. Go to our isolation kitchens and we will see you shortly. And we're back. Hello. Hello. Nick, we have gone away as instructed and poured out our delicious cocktails, the arsenic and old, the arsenic lace. And old lace. It's very clear and white and doesn't look suspiciously bubbling or yellow <laughs> or green. It's, not, it's got a slight hue to it. Well, Nick told me to put mine in the freezer and mine froze. I'm surprised it froze. The amount of alcohol there, I'm surprised it froze. It defrosted very quickly, I improvised. But I put it in a beautiful <laughs> chilled glass and my my lovely cut crystal glass. I thought I'd go I thought I'd go classic. Nice. Very nice. nice. Mine's a French champagne glass, so I think I've got Ooh, one up on it. Fancy. <laughs> it's a fancy podcast <laughs> okay well the arsenic and old lace we have is a gin based cocktail knowing my audience okay. um we've gone for a gin based cocktail so we have gin mm. we have vermouth mm. the starting of a martini then we have absinthe oh that's exciting no wonder it's alcoholic and violet liqueur ah! creme de violet the old lace, which is the violet, and the arsenic, which is the absinthe. Oh, totally. Parma violets. Everyone remembers those. From and... Granny's handbag and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Granny's <laughs> handbag. I like the fact that you were just taking Parma violets and I was taking money for crack. <laughs> <laughs> we had very different grandmothers. <laughs> <laughs> You say I'm here to analyse the uh, Mary Ann Cotton case, but I'm actually analysing you, you two. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we've got you on, right? Exactly. We need help. No, we're not going to launch this one. It's just therapy. Right? <laughs> it's a really convoluted way of getting it, but great. There's, there's no podcast, right? This is just all a setup. <laughs> My fee is £100. I'm intrigued to everyone's, what everyone thinks of this. All right, well, cheers, everyone. Let's get in for a taste. Cheers. Oh, I like it. Uh-huh. <laughs> Sinead doesn't You don't Is it the violet? Oh <laughs> Oh wait. Oh there's so many feelings <laughs> That's weird But Ro Do you like aniseed? No actually I don't Weirdly But uh, do you know what It's reminding me of Those sweets Those purple Well they're violet sweets Palm of violet like, oh, Is that Okay When you said that earlier I didn't really know What you were talking about <laughs> <laughs> You're such a good therapist, Ro. You're like, yeah, totally. I totally understand. What yeah, you absolutely. Do. Yeah. <laughs> Shh, don't get the game away. But there we go. Oh, so that... that is a. So I'm sensing it's not one for you, Sinead. I don't know. I don't know whether the freezing part of it ruined. I don't know. It tastes like. Okay, I'm not opposed to aniseed. It's not my favorite thing in the world. Um, for example, but I. It, it, to me, it tastes like ouzo right now. I don't mind mm. ouzo. I don't mind it in Greece. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Um, sorry, I'm second sip, second sip. 
It's gentler than Uzo, though, because Uzo is really harsh. This is yeah. a bit gentler. I can taste the violets. I can taste the absinthe. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 well, it's is it the arsenic that's in it? It is good. good way. It's good to be the arsenic, and your one is throwing it off slightly. Um, yeah, yeah, that's why yours tastes bad. Exactly. Yours are lovely. The two of you were like, mmm, yummy, and mine tastes like death, apparently. <laughs> I'm very suspicious and upset. <laughs> what do you think, Nick? I, I quite like it. I'd say, not usually a fan of the aniseed, but yeah, I think it's quite pleasant. It's not I, would, I mean, it's one that is going to get you... I can't swear, really, can I? But it's going to get you pissed. I think, I think um, you can swear, Nick. We swear constantly through this show. Oh, okay. Well, it's one that's going to get you twatted pretty quick. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there is no... Everything in there is alcoholic. There is no any sort of mixer, or apart from the water that's shaken, it's shaken with. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the it. thing, actually. I'm, that's what I'm worried about. But I'm, I'm going to drink it for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> but I do sense this is going to be a fun episode as a result It does of taste this. quite lethal. Ro, what are your thoughts? Is there any final thoughts or feelings? <laughs> they might be my final thoughts or feelings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I do like it. I'm a little bit worried about how I'll be at the end of it. <laughs> and it's quite strong. But uh, no, I like it. I don't think I've ever had absinthe before. Ever. So actually that is Ooh. a new experience for me. It's nice to have an absinthe cocktail. Famous drink of the Victorians and of the uh, of the Belle Epoque kind of era. And Moulin Rouge. Yeah, and Moulin Rouge. You know, that's what they, all they did in Moulin Rouge. If you've never seen that film, all they do is drink absinthe <laughs> and just hallucinate. But yeah, modern absinthe, not quite the, the thing that it was way back when. This Yeah, this is a French absinthe, this one. So it's imported from Ooh. France. So it's damn expensive. Ooh, okay. It's one of those things that I've been meaning to buy for months or well, years, in fact. And I thought, no, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. And one day, about three months ago i thought bugger it i'm gonna buy one well i feel very lucky i thought you were gonna say three weeks ago because that would have made sense no, 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 a few, a few, months back, a few months back three days ago lockdown became so depressing <laughs> fuck it it's one that will be in the in the cupboard though for probably a good couple of years to come because you use it so infrequently but isn't it isn't it true with absinthe that you can only have two i'm sure in france it's illegal or it was to have more than two. Oh, i don't that because, i don't know because it's be that honest. alcoholic probably if you're just drinking it neat maybe but this is say this the absinthe in here is a tiny fraction. So you've got two and a half gin, one part vermouth, and then a quarter of violet and a quarter of absinthe. Mm. So both of those are tiny proportions, but it's surprising how strongly they come across. So they're both such intense flavours. Tits. Um, You're such an alchemist, Nick. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. Um, and and it's, it's got a fantastic name. Exactly. And it's boozy and perhaps we will see the green fairy shortly. Um, Maybe so. <laughs> she'll just come on to Zoom in a minute. Just, um, <laughs> wonderful. The arsenic and old lace. Well, we've introduced our special guest, Ro. Now we're going to get rid of her really horribly. Yes. Ro is with us as an expert witness. And then we're going to do a bonus episode because we're in lockdown and you guys all deserve more podcasts from us. Even if you don't want them, you're getting them. <laughs> you got to get them. Ro's going to listen in. And so there will be a separate bonus episode that we're going to release a couple of days after this episode comes out um, with all of us uh, completely hammered from these cocktails. Ro, as we said, is an expert. You know, this is her profession. She's far better at all of this than us. So Ro, we will chat to you later. See yep, you I'll chat later. to you later. Nick. Yeah, hello there. We have our cocktails in hand. And are we ready for a story? I'm ready for a story. Uh, ready for a story. Take me on a journey. So as we said, we are talking about Marianne Cotton this week. Da da da. Da da da. Incredibly well-known case from the, we're back in the Victorian era. Yay! And of course we can't stay out there long because that's where all the poisoners live. <laughs> That's that's where we're going to be. Don't go down to the Victorian era. There's poisoners in there. <laughs> that's where the poisoners are from. <laughs> Born Mary Ann Robinson, the 31st of October, 1832, uh, to parents Michael and Margaret. Uh, Michael was a coal miner um, and they lived in County Durham in the north of England. And it's strange because many years later at her trial, a description of her as a child surfaced in an article in a, a paper called The Northern Star. Um, and she was described by her Sunday school superintendent Attendant. <laughs> and that is also a brilliant, a brilliant job title to have. But she was described as a most exemplary and regular attender, a girl of innocent disposition and average intelligence, distinguished by her particularly clean and tidy appearance. Oh. As it's also quite impressive that this the Sunday school attendant remembered her from probably a about 20 years uh, or so. Ah, yes. But then, isn't it, isn't it one of those cases where once the person has been convicted, I remember them, I remember them. I remember her well. I remember well. Them well. I um, was the only person who ever spoke to her. So you would think later on people always want to go, oh, I knew they were a wrong one. But, oh, an exemplary But yeah, no, girl. she was a... Very clean. Average intelligence. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> but an exemplary and regular attender. She was stupid, but she showed up. Yes, she came to Sunday school. Mary was about eight years old when they moved to a new village called Merton. Uh, not long after the move, Mary's father fell 150 foot um, to his death down a mine shaft oh, God. Um, at Merton Colliery. Um, where he worked so a, a tragic but probably not overly uncommon occurrence at, at the time um what was a a nice touch um from the people at merton colliery was her father's body was delivered back to her mother in a sack stamped <laughs> property of south heaton's coal company shut up no they put, they put him in your a father sack? your father fell down or your husband has fallen down a mine shaft Probably broken many things. Everything and died. Yes. <laughs> and we put him in. We put we put him in a bag. Oh God! And there you go. Have have your husband back. Uh, but also, as a, another nice whammy, that sort of the next day they get a a note from the um, colliery saying, "Can you please leave our house?" No, because the the cottage oh, where they lived was supplied by the the colliery. It was would have been one of the workmen's cottages. Job. That's all f- oh my God! So okay, in the space of what forty eight hours, he's fallen one hundred and fifty feet. I'm known for having no gauge of how far or tall things are. How how tall is one hundred fifty feet? Well, I don't know. You're talking like a two two story house is probably about twenty foot. Whoa. Maybe twenty twenty thirty foot for like a two story house. I understand now why the sack was needed. <laughs> There's not going to be much left. Who is the guy who has to drop that off? Not, not a fun not Knock a fun on the door. Job. Here's a sack. Is it? Oh, is it presents for all of us? Tis Christmas Day. You're, you're going to be disappointed when you open this sack. So Margaret, Mary's mother, is, is widowed without a home. But not long later, in fact, less than a year later, her mother remarried to a chap called George Stott, uh, who was also a minor. A minor is in that's a profession, not he was five. <laughs> so it's a bad joke. <laughs> so... <laughs> Rose having a brilliant time with this analysing everything you say. Um, if you're going to give me a cocktail of pure alcohol beforehand, you're going to have to expect some bad jokes out of this. So she married a minor bird. She remarried Shush to a minor called George Stott. Uh, so as I say, Mary and her stepfather did not get on at all well. And at 16, she fled the family home to a nearby village uh, mm. where she got a position as a household nurse. Okay. So the woman of the house oh. was was ailing, so she was employed to look after the lady of the house. So not necessarily a trained professional, but just... As no, a, no, a, just someone there, a, a companion to a nursemaid. Exactly, yes. Yeah, she wasn't in a hospital. She wasn't trained. In 1852, when Marianne was 20, she married a colliery labourer called William Mowbray uh, at Newcastle upon Tyne Registry Office. And they soon moved down to the southwest of England, somewhere in Cornwall. Don't know Lovely. exactly where, but we're looking in Cornwall. So quite a distance from where they were. Now, during this time, there are reports of four or five children, uh, Mary having four or five children by William while they're in the southwest of England. Now, unfortunately, there are no detailed reports or records of those children's names when they were born, legally having to record births and deaths didn't come into 1874. No records can be found of the, these children. So is that sort of that we don't know if they existed? We don't know if they survived? Well they, they, were, they certainly didn't survive, and I think very likely that they did exist. The first recorded child of Mary was um, a daughter called Margaret Jane, born in 1856. Now this is four years after they were married, so I think it's very unlikely that they wouldn't have had children pretty much straight away, as was very common at the time, um, to, to yes, wait I mean, four, four years, years of a gap. Um, to have their first child seems very unlikely. So Mary and William soon moved back up to, to County Durham, where William got a job as a fireman aboard a steamboat um, sailing out of Sunderland. What? A fireman on a steamboat. Why does he? Why, why were the firemen on steamboats? To stop the boat burning. Oh, right. Big Sorry. Okay. I heard that. It's just that their mode of transport was steamboat to go to fires. No, no. He was on a steamboat <laughs> transporting coal and such like. And he was a fireman to stop that boat. Exploding. Fair enough. I just thought that they had a <laughs> terrible way of getting firemen around. That's how I heard it. Yeah, that cocktail's gone straight to my it head. It is really strong, Nick. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I am already quite dipsy. <laughs> um, a second daughter named Isabella, was born in 1858. Unfortunately, Margaret Jane, the first daughter, died in 1860, aged four years old. Um, and a third daughter, also called Margaret Jane, the Margaret Jane the second, comes along in 1861, followed by a son hmm. in 1863. But he too, unfortunately, dies young. Um, and in 1863, he dies only one year old. Oh, God. She's lost her father to a horrific accident 
whatever's happened Absolutely. to the children, there seems to be a pattern of infant death, which is not, as we said, uncommon at the well, time. It's not uncommon of the, this time, absolutely. I mean, all the deaths that we've got record of, really, they seem to be a very common theme, but they were put down to gastric fever, which is a bit of a catch-all phrase yeah. at the time, to be, either was it typhoid or cholera. cholera, or any of those many sort of illnesses that were about at the time. But then 1865, William Mowbray himself dies of an intestinal disorder, no. which is... It's about as vague as inconclusive. We just know something in the stomach is a bit wrong. Um, <laughs> we don't know what it was, <laughs> but something there went awry. Yes, he has the devil in him. Yeah, yeah the, de- yeah, the You've devil. You've got ghosts in your blood. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it was ghosts. We don't know that it wasn't ghosts. But we don't know it wasn't. Don't know it wasn't. Mary had a stroke of luck in that, fortunately, the lives of William and the children were insured. Oh, how convenient. Which is which is which is quite convenient. Okay, I'm going with it. I, I have questions, but so <laughs> Mary collects a payout of thirty five pounds oh. on William's death, which is about three and a half thousand pounds in today's money, uh, which would have been about half a year's salary, so about six months' salary for a labourer. I thought you were going to say it was, she got thirty five pounds, which in those days was three and a half thousand pounds, which in those days was a million pounds. <laughs> Don't know why I thought you were going to keep going. <laughs> Do you need some coffee? I'm so drunk now. <laughs> no, I'm fine. So she also receives two pounds five shillings for their one year old son, who has also had a life insurance policy taken out on an infant. Taking a life insurance policy out on an infant, I had sympathy to a point, but now I have questions. <laughs> well, I don't know anyone yes. who would take life insurance out on a baby. I don't I, actually. I don't know. It was the, it was the family. It was so it was William and also several of his, the other children as well also had life insurance life insurance policies taken out uh, on them. So William, obviously being the breadwinner, was the highest payout. But a number of the other children uh, were also insured if it was done like under a family policy um, <laughs> or, or individually but in 1865 margaret jane the second dies of typhus so she's not having a lot, a lot of luck unfortunately leaving Mary Ann with only one of her potentially nine children that she's had so far isabella uh, is remaining if I were isabella i would be worried <laughs> She's the only one left. Now, Marianne now takes a job at the Sunderland Infirmary House of Recovery for the cure of contagious fever, dispensary and humane society, okay. which is a long old thing to have on a plaque outside a building. It's probably just a load of rich people in Sunderland going, aren't we lovely and very generous? We shall feed all the poor, starving people. Have some bread. <laughs> that is what they did. That's, what, the time. that's what they did. They came by going, we need, we need medical supplies and houses. Bread for you. The remaining child, Isabella, is sent to live with Mary's mother um, and stepfather probably a good thing i think it's probably probably wise at this point at the sunderland infirmary house of recovery for the cure of contagious fever dispensary and humane society one of her <sighs> patients was an engineer called george ward and her and george quickly struck up a relationship and they were married on the 28th of august 1865 Hello. that's quite a quick striking up of a relationship how long well, we're talking less than a year since the death of her last husband. Mm. So William Mowbray dies in January 1865. She's married to George Ward in August 1865. So she doesn't hang around. But I mean, George is in, is in hospital. He's, he's a patient in this hospital and he's been ill for quite some time. And something about him attracted her to him. Something about his separating wounds and his wheezy cough. <laughs> something about his nice insurance policy may have had something to do with it <laughs> because less than a year later... Doctors are surprised at his sudden and unexplained death. <gasps> so October 1866, George is no more. But she gave it a year. She gave it a year. And the, the healthy insurance payout, I'm sure, helped console the grief. I think it would. I think it would It would. It would help. Does your money keep you warm at night, make you happy? <laughs> yes. Thank yes, you. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so after the death of her second husband, George, only one month later, mind, widower James Robinson hires Mary Ann as a housekeeper. So obviously she needs new employment now. She's not married. She needs a job. She gets hired as a housekeeper hmm. to James Robinson, um, who is himself, as say, a, a widower with, with children of his own, ah. which is nice. But a month later, in December, James's infant son, John, dies. What? Dies of the ominous and ever-present gastric fever. No! Yes. But in, his, in James's time of need, where does he turn? For comfort. To her heaving breast. Housekeeper Mary. And two months later, she's pregnant. Pregnant! <laughs> Again. Again, we, ha- we are seeing this. Oh no, the death, the death. I must shag my housekeeper. <laughs> but at the same time, this is, this is going on in the household of uh, James Robinson. Mary's mother becomes quite ill. Um, she becomes ill with hepatitis. But she's 54. Ancient. Getting, I don't say getting on a bit, but she's had a respect. She's lived a, a 
decent length of time for a working class woman in this period. So Mary goes back to her mother's to try and help her convalesce. But nine days later, after Mary's arrival, she's dead. Oh, Jesus. Inexplicably. Dreadful stomach cramps, pain, vomiting. Oh, I'm dead. Mary, Mary so. is not a good nurse. She's she's not doing well at the nursing. She's not doing well at the nursing. The housekeeping and the shagging, yes. Getting pregnant. <laughs> Getting pregnant. She's very, but very But she's good a terrible that. nurse, mate. But then her mother, obviously, who's been looking after her child, her granddaughter. Looking after Isabella. I don't think she can be blamed for every single possible person who died around her. The mortality rate was very high. Infant mortality rate was very high. But anyway, so Mary takes her daughter Isabel back to live in the household of James Robinson. Well, that's good of her. Doesn't want to leave him with a stepfather. He and Mary never got on very well. So And yet he survives. Surprise. So Isabella goes back with Mary to the house of James Robinson. But as was becoming a familiar theme, Isabella, oh, stomach's feeling a bit dodgy. No! Yes. What? what? Yes, yes, yes. And Isabella dies. But not just Isabella. Okay. Two of James's children, Elizabeth and James, also pass away, also die from this surprisingly common gastric fever. Is anyone pointing this out at the time? Well, it would appear Is not. Is anyone ringing a bell outside the house going, Jesus Christ? I say infant mortality rates are high at this time. She's also, she's moving around. She's, she's staying within the county oh. Durham sort of area, but she's moving from village to village, town to town. So it's not as if she's in the one place all the time and she's got a reputation jumping all over the place. So people perhaps don't know what's her history. And we have these three children who have died. Her own daughter. And her two not stepchildren, because at the moment James is not married. James and Mary are married. But all three of them die uh, and are buried within two weeks of each other in 1867. Are we to conclude that uh, the children had some sort of policy taken out on their lives? Well, no, I don't think they did. Oh! I don't think they did, but at the time, if James was to mysteriously have died, they would have inherited first. Oh, okay, right. They are in the way, potentially, of her Uh... getting any sort of inheritance um, or benefiting in a will if James in the future was to suddenly pass. That makes sense for them. But Isabella, we have to question of, is she just in the way in just, general? Just, oh, fuck, I've got to look after this daughter now. Ugh. But Isabella obviously was the daughter from the first marriage. She does have a life insurance policy. Uh, from the from the family policy they took out previously. <laughs> so she gets five pounds, ten shillings and six pence. For the big family policy that covers all children and all people who have only been in the house. Yes. And that is the cost of a human life. So in a somewhat hastily arranged marriage, marriage james and mary marry in august 1867 and she was six months pregnant at the time so there may have been some whispers in the community about that slightly speedy speedy relationship surely not (laughs) margaret isabella was born in november 1867 margaret isabella margaret isabella middle name after the daughter that has died margaret is the mother's name is isabella is the the daughter considering from her first marriage she named two children identically she's not an imaginative woman is she well if you have so many children it's difficult to keep track (laughs) call them all the same thing James and Mary have another son, their second child, um, George, in 1869. See, now at this point, James Robinson has started to get slightly suspicious. He's now suspicious while he's just walking over the corpses of dead children in his house. He's, he's suspicious, I think not necessarily for the death, but Mary is insisting that he takes out a life insurance policy. <laughs> for not just himself, but for the children as well. Ooh, that's chilling. He has some older children left from this original marriage, and then the two children that he's had with Mary. And then he discovers that she has been running up debts behind his back. No. She owes £60. Pounds. <gasps> 60 A hell of a lot of money. That's worth, what, £14 million pounds back in the Victorian age? Well, a year's wages. Oh, a year's wages. Yeah, £14 million. Pounds. That's what I earn. So it's, it's an awful lot of money. There was £50 pounds that she had been given by him to take to the bank, and that £50 pounds never made it to the bank. Obviously. Do we know what she spent the money on? That, don't what, know. Oh, we don't have details on the debts. What do we think she would have spent them on? Well, I'm thinking probably a nice hat. <laughs> um, with a big A on it. <laughs> with a big, a big, big A on it. She spent it all on hats and uh, ornamental bird cages. I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go with ornamental bird cages. Classic Victorian vice. The last draw for James. Mary had been forcing his older children to steal items from the house and pawn them what? and give her the cash. I mean, he was a shipbuilder. He was a shipwright. A respectable job. Probably a relatively well-paid job. Certainly more money than a than a coal miner or a common labourer. She's done She's done well in the world then, yeah. I mean, it's how he could afford to have hired a, a housekeeper in the first place. A sexy maid. A yes. sexy maid. He's, he's not done well in that front. Let's, let's not give him credit on that. <laughs> he may be able to build a ship. He can't spot when there's a child-killing seductress in his house, shagging him. And how did he not notice all his furniture was gone? I don't know. He walks in each day. 
each day and just goes, that carriage clock was there. Quickly, have sex with me. Have another baby. <laughs> but, but by this time, he has twigs. Something is awry. And he kicks her out of the house. Hey! He, he manages to maintain custody of the son, George. Oh, thank God. Thankfully. So George is safe with his father, Mary, out on the streets. Yeah. Homeless. Good. Desperate, living on the street. But she's still had some friends. How? Um, one of her friends. Oh, are they all the insurance people? They are her <laughs> friends 100%. Potentially. But her friend, Margaret Cotton, introduces Mary to her brother, Frederick Cotton. Himself, a widower, had already lost two of his four children. But Frederick's sister, Margaret, had been acting as a substitute mother for her two nephews. But in March 1870, guess what happened to Margaret Cotton? She dies. She dies. Oh, the stomach. Oh, the gastric fever. But what is Mary to do? Console, <laughs> console, dear Frederick. She's very good at that consoling. You can just see her hand creeping over the shoulder. Oh, dear. Come to me, my boy. It's fine. I shall comfort you. Comfort you with my breast. Let me comfort you in my special, special way. Oh, look, I'm pregnant. <laughs> That was quick. <laughs> it was very, it was very quick. <laughs> so this, this by now is child eleven or twelve. Jesus Christ! Regardless of anything else, that woman must have the constitution of an ox. Oh God, it's yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a lot going on. It's a lot of babies. It's either either eleven or twelve, depending on how many she had with her first husband. But then Frederick Cotton and Mary are married on the seventeenth of September. 1870 in Newcastle and this is where she takes her name now considering at the time she's actually still married to James oh, Robinson of course he's just booted her out of the house he's had a damn lucky escape um, so she's still married yeah that's not going to start Mary a little bit of bigamy that's neither here nor there a little bigamy big of all of us <laughs> absolutely so that's, that's not going to get in her way her son with Frederick, uh, is born in 1871. A little boy called Robert. Ah, Robert. She's branched out in the name department then. She has, actually. Yes, that's very true. Robert. She's really Robert? You don't want to call it George or you or Mary? It's a boy. Call it Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Not long after the birth of Robert, Mary gets wind of a little rumour that a former lover of hers, <gasps> a guy called Joseph Natras, Oh, that's a good name. was himself no longer married. Obviously, Mary had always held a little bit of a candle. For, for Joseph, but he was out of bounds. He was married, but now he was free. Bah, crap, but I'm married. Two, in fact, two people I'm married. Um, <laughs> Shit. <laughs> so. I've really screwed myself over here. So what's so sexy about Joseph then? Well, we don't know why Joseph is so alluring. Beautiful eyes. But obviously she's held a candle and she manages to persuade Frederick and the rest of the family to move 30 miles to the village of West Auckland, which is where Joseph Natras is living. Okay. So what excuse or reason she gave for wanting to move 30 miles away? Probably not, but my lover lives there. It'll be so convenient <laughs> for me. Um. <laughs> I feel the air is better over here 30 miles <laughs> Potentially. away. I, I, be, I believe the birds are, are, are quite splendid at this time of year. And they have all these empty cages. I didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> so. So they move. They move to West Auckland and Mary rekindles this romance with joseph natras i think it's one of those things that we will talk to roe about afterwards but marianne is a persuasive woman absolutely she has some power of persuasion she has control over these men of whatever's happening to take out these insurance policies to convince the children to do these things she must have been a master of persuasion for, for sure you know i don't know if she was particularly i've seen the odd picture of her don't know if she was particularly well, beautiful pictures, was able to use her feminine the, wow the pictures that you, that you see if you I'm just, her. I've just seen Rogue. She's on camera while we're recording. Just make a face like she really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not for modern standards. I don't know. It's not my area of expertise, to be honest. <laughs> but anyway, they've moved to this new village, West Auckland. But wouldn't you believe it? 1871 December, just a year after marrying man Frederick. Oh, he's dead. Oh, he's dead. Oh, he's dead. That gastric fever gastric strikes again. fever is always there. They will eat those spicy peppers. Those insurance payouts, they do soften the blow. What? So Mary is now left. Dabbing her eyes. Widowed for the third time. Um, but she's left with her son, Robert, and two stepsons, Frederick Jr. and Charles. To make ends meet, she decides to take in a lodger. Get a bit of income. Can you guess who it is? Is it the sexy Joseph? It's dear old Joseph. Oh, it's Joseph. <laughs> Joseph, sexy Joseph comes Sex, in. Sexy Joseph. I'm picturing Joseph is quite uh, quite sexy. I've decided. I'm sure he probably was. He's got a good name. Nat Natris. He, he kind of like... N-A-T-T-R-A-S-S. It's a good name. So he's moved in as the lodger. How how convenient. Uh, the children spend the nights kind of going, Mummy is spending a lot of time in the lodger's room. 
them <laughs> jumping up and down. But then she also, at, at this time, takes in a job as um, a nurse again to a customs officer who is recovering from smallpox. Uh, he obviously must have looked particularly sad because there she is, comforting again. Naked. All that consoling <laughs> that Mary can do that she is so oh, very gosh. good at. Oh, look, I'm pregnant. Oh, I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. She's got a tactic or two. Got a formula and it's worked for her so far. Now, Frederick Jr., one of Frederick Sr.'s sons from his original marriage, dies March 1872. And very soon after, one-year-old Robert also goes the same way. So now there is only Charles left. Charles, her stepson, is the only child that she has remaining. Apart from she is now, she's currently pregnant uh, with customs officer's child. But Charles, he's getting in the way. Mm. It's annoying having this little Charles running around the place. She goes to the parish and says, this here Charles, can I put him in the workhouse? Oh, come on. (laughs) He's my step, he's not even my son. Stepson. And I'm expected to look after this stepson. Oh, my God. How inconvenient. <laughs> they say, you can go to the workhouse, but um, but you have to go with them. Oh, really? Yes. Well, you can go to the workhouse. But obviously, if you can't look after Charles, then you probably can't look after yourself either. Nice. So yes. you, you want him in the workhouse, then you're going in the workhouse to look after him. And she goes, hmm... I think I'll pass. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. I have another solution. But she, as, she's, as she's walking out of the door of the parish office after they said, they said no, she says, don't worry, I won't be troubled long. He'll go like all the rest of the cottons. Just in passing. And no one says anything. Just in passing no to the anything. parish official. Why would you say such a thing? I don't know. Perhaps he muttered it under her breath in a sort of sneaky way. <laughs> don't worry. I'm sure he'll meet an untimely end. <laughs> what was that? Nothing, honestly. But then, five days later, Mary returns, tells Riley, Thomas Riley, who is the, the parish officer, that Charles has died. Now, at long last, someone goes. Really? Hang on a minute. Something's <laughs> a bit weird. Uh, Riley thinks this now, nah, this this doesn't add up. Only a few days ago, Mary was asking to put Charles in this in the workhouse, and now he's dead. This is all very coincidental. Oh, for God. So he goes to the constable. Hooray, Thomas Riley. Hurrah for Thomas Riley. And says, this is, this is what happened. I think this is really weird. And he convinces he them not that? to write out the death certificate. I don't know if he went there going, oh, this is a bit weird. This, this is. is like really weird. But I don't have it exactly written down. Okay. But whatever he says, he convinces them not to write out the death certificate. And that an investigation must take place. Now, Mary, at this point, she doesn't go to the, the undertaker, try and arrange a funeral. Doesn't go to the doctor. What's happened to my dear stepson? Where did she go? Oh, that insurance office. Oh, for God's That's sake. the best place to go. <laughs> That's the place. That's the place to go after my stepson has died. I will go to the insurance office. My grief cannot be contained apart from by money. <laughs> but they go no, no, no. Yay! There is no death certificate. The death certificate hasn't been signed, so the insurance are going. Nah, not doing that. See, now at this point, you're probably thinking, well, Mary might be going, ah, shit. You would think that, yeah. <laughs> you, would, you would hope that they're going, oh, God, they, there's going to be an inquest into the death of Charles. An inquest is held okay. for Charles Cotton. Natural causes, they say. What? Natural causes. Riley went out of his way to get Mary Ann Cotton because she had rejected his advances. So he was out to get her. No! And spread these terrible rumours about that. I mean, Marianne Cotton, not known for rejecting men. It has to be <laughs> yeah, exactly. Standing there in the dock, pregnant, <laughs> with all of her lovers lined up going, who are you? I'm, I'm married to her. What? <laughs> this was the one guy she turned down. Exactly, apparently. the one guy she turned down. And because she turned him down, uh, he tried to convince everyone she killed her stepson. And this is her defence. This, this is her defence. So, the natural causes. The coroner comes back and, and they says, believe no. her. And they believe they Again, this her. is shaping up Marianne Cotton. Just what a liar. And what, what an liar absolute and... constructor of the most horrible webs of stories. But everyone believes her. Everyone believes her. What happens now is you would think that's probably that it's put to bed. Natural causes, it's done. Death certificate is signed. End of story. Many please. But what happens now is something that only really starts to happen in the Victorian times. So that the papers get hold of the story. Start off with, it's the local press. They find out what's going on. They start writing about it. And they start picking apart Mary's life. Where has she been? Where has she been? Oh, she's got a husband there. Oh, she's got a husband there. Oh, she's still married to that husband over there. She's had this child and that child and that child. So four husbands, three of them dead. A dead lover, a dead mother, and potentially 12 dead children. With a 13th oh. on the way. All of whom die from the ominous gastric fever to be fair to mary infant mortality rates very high at this time and no doubt a number of her children were legitimate tragic 
early deaths, f- f- not by her hand. Mm. But I, but a mortality rate of one hundred percent is somewhat high. Yes, it's somewhat. Um, that high. is higher. That is a bit higher than average. I think on this occasion we can say. Without too much fear of retribution that, you know, she she was killing kids. And if one of her children tragically died of natural causes, I don't think it bothered her that much. So I have zero sympathy. Oh, I'm sure. If if that hadn't happened, then the, the child, child would have gone died. the same way. For sure. I mean, what what happens now is that, say, the, the press have got hold of the story. Say, then the rumours start. The rumours start. Rumours give rise to suspicions. And suspicions start investigations. Mm. Well, then we enter a new chap, a Dr. William Byers Kilburn. He was a physician who had attended young Charles um, in his last days. And he was a cautious man. He was a, a clever man. He was a scientist. He had taken samples. How old was Charles when he died? Well, I don't know, actually, because he was one of Frederick's sons he, from his did first we say marriage. Is he an infant or is he a preteen? Oh yes, he he no no, he's he's very much younger than 5. Yeah, okay, fine. But yeah, Dr. Kilburn with the growing suspicion around Charles's death, he decided that he was going to test some of these samples. And lo and behold, what do we find? We find arsenic. Arsenic! And we get to the poison of the week. <laughs> arsenic alarm! Arsenic alarm! So we get to the poison, and we, yes, he discovers arsenic. He goes to the police straight away and says, this, this woman's been in the paper, this child has died, I found arsenic. And they promptly arrest Mary. Arsenic. The greatest poison of them all. <laughs> it's certainly up there. Mary is promptly arrested, and they actually order an exhumation of Charles's body. Mm. Um, I think it was a, it was an incredibly serious and sombre thing to have to dig up, especially a child's body, especially at the time where you think mm. the body was such a the, with the religious conviction such as it was um, in the Victorian times that Absolutely. disturb someone's earthly remains was to disturb them in heaven as well. So Exactly, but then there's the fight against religion and science coming to the fore so much more in the Victorian era. Absolutely. Marianne is charged with the murder of Charles, but the trial did have to be delayed because she had to give birth to her 13th. So yeah, they had to pause the trial and the daughter... Margaret Edith Quick Manning Cotton. Quick Manning. Quick Manning was the surname of the customs officer. So Cotton's trial, so Marion Cotton, her trial begins on the 5th of March in 1873. The prosecution was led by a chap called Charles Russell. Um, an interesting fellow, actually, who we may well come across in future episodes. Um, he also ran the prosecution for Florence Maybrick and for Adelaide Bartlett, two other famous uh, poisoners of the Victorian very, age. Very, very, very famous ladies of the victorian age and poisons we are definitely covering those cases because those are deliciously good (laughs) yeah this one chap charles russell he runs the prosecution for all three of them cotton was his first the defense they argue that charles has died from inhaling arsenic that had been used in the wallpaper of the, the cotton's home it is a surprisingly common theme that arsenic was used for so many different applications arsenic in the wallpaper people will have probably heard about some of these stories one of the fascinating things about arsenic is that several of the compounds are very brightly colored so from arsenic you get a very vibrant yellow you get a beautiful red and you get the arsenic green were much more effective than vegetable dyes that you would use in wallpaper so you would have the the green pigments put into wallpaper they looked so stunning so beautiful came from poison so people were coating their wallpaper in this they were coating other bits of their furniture they were even using it in food dyes in cake icing in toys to color them as well but arsenic was very much in the home in all of these things just because it looks so pretty because it looks pretty so that 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 was the defense that yeah the arsenic from the wallpaper had leached out that summer had actually been incredibly hot um, and the wallpaper had started flaking so there were particles of this pigment um, in the air and they had been breathed in just by the inhabitants of the house which was a legitimate thing that did happen in this trial you can use it as a legitimate defense well not legitimate it's more of a kind of this probably (laughs) happened well it was it was a bit of a hail mary because the (laughs) nice football reference from you actually nick i don't think i yeah, never hurt you. Is that, is that a football? Yes, a hail mary. Is that a hail a mary? Reference? Is from um, is from American football. I know the term. I mean, again, my American football knowledge is limited. It's a hail mary. It's a last ditch attempt. I was assumed it was some religious. But thing, no, it's honest. American. Nick, you know about sport. I know about oh, sports. Arsenic has brought this. One to of you. my proudest moments ever. Pub quiz. I got a sports question that Ben didn't know. <gasps> Ben is Sinead's husband. He was sports mad. Who is sports mad? Which what was what was the question? It was what was a uh, Zamboni. Oh, I don't know that. 
What is what is a Zamboni, people? It's it's the big. Um... Oh, actually, don't say anything. Okay, don't say anything. You know... And I knew the answer from watching far too many <laughs> ah! dodgy American cop shows and things. <laughs> people, we're not going to reveal the answer. You know what? It's episode ten. Right in with your answers. <laughs> I was I was proud of myself. Anyway, moving on from death by sports equipment, the the prosecution were able to refute the uh, death by wallpaper theory, saying that if the particles had been in the air, then the throat would show some sign of inflammation, swelling, or something. There would be some evidence of that in the throat, and there was no evidence of any of that. So they assumed no. I mean, there's not actually a huge amount of of detail of what the prosecution did rely on as their as their evidence the main thing being obviously that the trail of destruction that had followed mary wherever she had been the fact that she had lost 12 of her 13 children um and three of her husbands had passed had died and also that she had been witnessed from buying arsenic yeah the the prosecution did latch onto that as it took less than 90 minutes for the jury to come back she was guilty because that even even at that sort of time you couldn't she couldn't have shagged all of them in that time no probably probably not it would have been 90 tricky. minutes she would have slipped around going hello let me nurse you do you need comforting do you need comforting <laughs> in the time of your deliberation so on the 24th of march only 19 days after the start of her trial mary was led to the gallows by hangman william Callcroft. now this gets a bit gruesome to be perfectly honest with you i am here for it mary standing on the the scaffold Ooh. noose around her neck and he pulls the lever to release the trapdoor. Mary falls. She falls two foot. Oh. Nowhere near enough for her neck to break. She is left there hanging two foot, clawing at the noose around her neck. Can't breathe, struggling to breathe, just hanging there. William Coolcroft, the executioner, is his his last resort is he grabs her shoulders and pulls her down Ooh. to try and speed up the process of her death an absolutely gruesome way for her to go not the usual long drop neck snapped quick clean painless this was an excruciatingly unpleasant death witnessed by many people the governor of the prison her um, her wardens and things like that members of the press were there and they were all absolutely horrified and members of the public would be turning out as well. this one was an enclosed members of the public were not allowed this was not oh. a public execution this was in county durham jail but you but she took but they're all witnessing but they're all this, witnessing, they're witnessing this this spectacle but i mean this was one of colcross very last executions now i'm not surprised <laughs> he retired very shortly after this there are rumors around the interweb of dark rumors that this was not just simply a miscalculation on on his part this was a deliberate this woman needed to suffer so either he had been paid by someone to make her suffering more to lengthen this execution out or it could have been a legitimate blunder in the measuring it's a really that is a really moral mire should they suffer should they suffer for everything they have done i mean you consider i mean she she was on trial for the murder of charles that's it one boy so all the all the, the husbands and the 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 other children and things they i suppose in effect they don't get justice there she's never brought to trial for their murders oh is that maybe the case then that the, the hangman thought he was bringing justice to all the people who were not Potentially. included in the case Ooh, that is gruesome that is it gruesome. is, it is a, it's a des- desperately unpleasant she's left there for an hour as is the law you have to leave you she's left hanging there for an hour after they I think she said she's she's taken down and a cast of her head is made and it is sent to the west hartlepool phrenological society yes i do know this for them to examine the bumps and <laughs> bumps and nubbins on her skull to see oh yes this is obviously a crazy crazy lady i love phrenology i'm gonna go out there and say that i don't i don't put any stock in it whatsoever there's a part of your brain is going phrenology don't be so stupid you can't actually analyze anyone by the bumps in the head but i also think it's fascinating it's incredible there's this whole area of uh very much inverted commas science i, I just think it's amazing the, the whole idea of phrenology i am here for it feel people's heads do not ask them their feelings see if they have a big bump here that means they like broccoli <laughs> and they will kill people well, obviously it was quite a well-regarded science at the time because i'm like i was liking the name of that society 
it's it's the West Hartlepool Phrenological Society. So I'm thinking also there was an East Hartlepool one and a Northern Hartlepool <laughs> one and a Southern one. Um, they all so fought. They all fought about the <laughs> so, frontal lobes. And then there were wars. That was it. <laughs> those, those classic phrenology wars. Um, but it was it was it was for a tiny period of time. Well, a tiny sort of reported period of time because this um, phrenology dates back thousands of years, thousands of years. But there was a tiny period of time relative to everyone basically going no this is rubbish people were they were investigating it they were they had experts who could be called in and i'm very much one of those people is like no that's not true but also maybe <laughs> so i mean that cast from her her skull is also used by madame two swords and marianne cotton became a long-term guest in the chamber of horrors where she was actually posed with babe in arms, irony of it all. She's she's no longer there, I believe. I think she has been she's been moved many years ago. Do you think like her and William Palmer was side by side at some point? Potentially, just looking lovingly at each other. So that is the story of Mary Ann Cotton. Yay! Gruesome, gruesome story of a horrendous woman. Oh, <sighs> it's a biggie. It's yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of story. There's a lot of. I mean. You see, my pages of notes were trying to work out when various children were born and died. And well, it's, it's very, very confusing. I mean, it's one of the big stories from the Victor- Victorian era. She is so well known. She's been written about many times after this. At the same time, there's so little known, really, when you want to delve into the psychology of why did she do that? And why was she marrying? And why did how how did this work? How did she keep convincing people all this time, right up until the end of a trial? How did she get away with it? And you know what? We know someone with some answers. I think we know someone with some answers. <laughs> we are naive and we don't have the training. And also, thanks to Nick's cocktail, we're too drunk to <laughs> even approach discussing this. We are going to hand over to Ro and we are going to be on an extra episode that's going to come out later this week. Talking about this case, talking about all the psychology behind female poisoners. And let's carry on the debate afterwards. But otherwise, Mary Ann Cotton, what a story. And why is arsenic the greatest poison of them all? <laughs> Nick, thank you for all the work you've done. We said last week we really want to give some appreciation back to our listeners. Thank you for listening. So many people are away from their loved ones, away from their family, but you have invested your time in listening to this podcast and we cannot tell you how much we appreciate it. We love you. Um, But we really wanted to give a chance for people to share the love about the loved ones they can't speak to, the businesses that they want to support. We will do it every single week. If you want to give a shout out to someone you love on our podcast, we will make every effort to do so. The first one we have is from Mrs. Monster. We're using your Instagram handle, so if it's not your real name, feel free to let us know. Mrs. Monster says, I only live a mile away from my mum, Jill, but I miss her so much. She drives to my house occasionally and we chat and she stays in her car, but not being able to hug her is killing me. I live with someone who's type 1 diabetic, so can't be too careful with my social distancing rules. I usually see my mum every day and she's my best friend. I get weepy when I see her and she's on her own as my pops works abroad. She's an absolute badass and complete legend. I love her so much. I'm glad she's got her three mad cats to keep her company. And that's from Claire. Mrs. Monster is her Instagram handle. But from Claire saying to her mum, Claire, you are an absolute legend. You are a lovely person. Okay, so this next one is from Dorothy Olive Neal, again from Instagram. She has said, I can see her, so it might not be a priority, but I'd like to give a shout out to my BFF and housemate Jez, who I keep keep prompting to listen to your podcast, but she keeps forgetting to do so. This might be because of our quarantine habit, habit of drinking cocktails made from the weird stuff at the back of the drinks cabinet is an excellent way to find out new cocktails while you drunkenly retell and act out the poisoning stories for her as amusing as is this i'm sure you guys will do a better job so this may maybe this will incentivize her to tune in on the regular i hope you do and i hope you all stay safe final shout out from a dear friend of mine and nick's who very kindly commented uh this is from tim who is dry wipe history on instagram he's uh, an incredible artist and a history teacher he's one of our key workers as well out there teaching the kids and he just said can i shout out to you and nick because it's an arse british that i can't come up to canterbury to see you we miss you tim we love you thank you so much for love supporting you, us Uh, And we will see you soon. Do send us some messages, post, comment, wherever you need to, if you want us to do a shout out. 
also want to say a huge thank you to Kevin and Becca at We Need to Talk About Ghosts for having uh, Sinead and I on as a uh, special guest round on their recent paranormal quiz on Saturday. It was fantastic, great fun to do, thank and you. a great evening. So thank you very much for inviting us along to that. So, as ever, we have been the people inside the Poisoner's Cabinet. We will see you next week, and remember, your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.